Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our Introduction to Biblical Studies course. And for the second time this course, we are in Singapore. It's appropriate that we make a second trip to this city-state in Southeast Asia, because today's class is all about word study and literary character. The power of words. You know that fast food fried chicken restaurant, Churches? It exists here in Singapore, but it goes by a different name, Texas Chicken. Why? Singapore is very proud of avoiding interreligious conflict, and churches would seem to be a little too sectarian. So the company decides to name itself after one of the states in the US. In reality, we all know there are states that have better fried chicken than Texas, one of which is my home state, Georgia, but we won't tell them that. In any case, let's look at our agenda for today. We're first going to look at different translation philosophies. What are the things we need to keep in mind when we're looking at different Bible translations? And then we're gonna look at how word study is done within the historical critical method, within diachronic analysis of the Bible. We'll then look at how words are examined in some of the different synchronic approaches to the Bible. Before we delve into any of this, however, I wanna go over a few definitions, a few basic terms that are used when we're studying words. Let's distinguish between several things. Morphology refers to how words change their spelling based on how they are used in a sentence. Related to morphology is grammar, which is the relationships between words in a single sentence. How do nouns relate to adjectives and adverbs, and how do verbs relate to adverbs, conjunctions, prepositions, and all of that. Then we look at syntax. Syntax refers to how the different grammatical elements are arranged in a hierarchy or are ordered within a sentence to articulate meaning. Think about how prepositional phrases are subordinate to subjects and verbs. Think also about how subordinating conjunctions and subordinate clauses relate to main clauses or coordinate clauses. This is all syntax. Then we look at idiom, which is the common usage of a given language. If I were to say, it's raining cats and dogs outside, PETA need not be afraid. We're not talking about animal abuse. Rather, we're talking about it raining an awful lot, like it tends to do here in Florida, or in Singapore for that matter. Etymology, the history of a given word, which may be complex. Sometimes we're gonna see, especially in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, we're gonna see words have a Hebrew heritage that goes back to how th words were used in the Old Testament and how they were used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, coming into contact with Greek philosophy, words that have a Greek heritage. We're gonna see a good example of that with the word flesh a little later in today's class. And then we wanna distinguish between the semantic meaning of a word, which is a word's inherent meaning, that part of a word, that meaning that does not change to, regardless of context, and its pragmatic effect. That is, what does the word mean in a specific context and may even go beyond something you'll find in the dictionary. Let's look at an example. Suppose a wife says to her husband, your son had a little incident today with the car, bless his heart. You can tell I'm a southerner. Notice a few features here. Morphology had instead of have. That change of morphology, that change of the verb's form indicates this is a past tense incident. Grammar. Son is the subject, had is the verb, incident to the direct object, and everything else modifies elements within that basic structure. Syntax. With the car is a prepositional phrase that modifies the incident. It tells us the scope of that incident. Word order also tells us that with the car refers to the incident, not the son, as opposed to, say, a son that doesn't have a car. Idiom. Bless his heart, as we all know, is a Southern way of insulting someone also politely and genteelly. Semantic meaning versus practical effect. Semantic meaning your son literally just means a son that belongs to the audience, the male offspring of the person being addressed in the sentence, in this case, the husband. Practical effect though, here's the pragmatic effect. Your son as opposed to our son. This has the effect of distancing. The wife is saying, it's your son, husband. She's moving a step back from the action and placing a little bit more responsibility on the husband. In this case, the son is both your son and our son, but the choice of your son adds something to the sentence. The same is true in the languages of the Bible. We wanna be attentive to when 
speakers or the inspired author are saying something and the word choice adds meaning. It could have been said any number of different ways. This specific choice is laden with meaning. So with all that as background, let's look at translations. There are two basic translation philosophies, but before we look at them, I want to give you these three core translation principles. First is that every translation is but an approximation. It can never replace the original language. Translations are no substitute for the original. They're no substitute for the real thing. Second principle, while the original text's meaning is fixed, our knowledge of the language in which it was written has changed over time. This is why, as a scholar, I generally want my students to use translations that have been produced within the last 30 or so years, because they've been produced in light of the latest research of ancient Hebrew grammar, or ancient Greek grammar, or lexicography. We simply know more about these languages than we did even 60 some odd years ago when the Revised Standard Version was first translated in 1952, much more so than the Douay Reims or the King James Version, these centuries old translations. And the third principle, a translation's value may differ based on its user's circumstances. So given that, here are our two translation philosophies. Dynamic equivalence, which is a more casual, thought-for-thought -thought approach to translation, one that breaks down foreign or complex grammar into something more familiar, resolving ambiguities and usually giving us shorter sentences. Contrast that with a formal correspondence translation, which is more word for word, more formal, and tends to preserve ambiguities or particular modes of expression that might be a little foreign to us native English speakers or speakers of any modern language, and they generally tend to result in longer sentences. Here's an example, Galatians 5.13. The New American Bible Revised Edition, which is what we're looking at here on the first line, it's the translation I usually use in these videos, for you were called for freedom, brothers, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, rather serve one another through love. The New American Bible is somewhere in the middle, closer by a little to formal correspondence than dynamic equivalence. You'll notice verbum here, all of this comes from verbum, gives a percentage difference. The highest percentage difference is the NJB, this fourth option, the New Jerusalem Bible. It says something a little looser. And that's consistent with the translation philosophy of the New Jerusalem Bible, which tends to be more of a dynamic equivalence translation. If you look at the ESV, which is much more formal correspondence, 22% difference and more literal. One other thing to notice, in the NRSV, the translators add brothers and sisters. This is consistent with that translation's desire to interpret, even if the language is masculine, if they've concluded that it has in mind a mixed audience, that is a male and female audience, they'll tend to use male and female language. With that background, we're now ready to look at word study within the historical critical method. You'll remember, we've already made this distinction between diachronic and synchronic analysis. Again, the diachronic approach is the historical critical method. It looks at how the text evolved and emerged over time. Synchronic approaches look at the final form of the text without regard to how it evolved over time, how it got to the final form, and this consists principally of literary approaches such as narrative analysis and rhetorical analysis. Within the historical critical method, within diachronic study, word study is our second of six steps. It takes a comprehensive inventory of everything we've talked about so far, morphology, grammar, syntax, idiom, etymologies, all of that it's gonna look at and try to figure out precisely what do these words mean in context. We've already looked at this verse, for you were called for freedom, brothers, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, rather serve one another through love. The historical critical method is going to look especially at that word highlighted in red, flesh, sarx in Greek, and is going to ask the question, does St. Paul here mean to say that our bodies are bad? that human flesh itself is morally suspect, or does he have a different meaning? And what the historical critical method is going to find, it's going to see that this word flesh has both a Hebrew background, the Hebrew word basar, rendered sarx in the Septuagint, usually refers to creation as distinct from the creator. A Hebrew understanding of this term would not say that our bodies are bad, it would rather be a shorthand for human selfishness. 
Here we think Paul means the Hebrew meaning, that Paul is saying, don't be selfish, and that's consistent with the context. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity to gratify the flesh, gratify yourselves, but rather serve one another through love. The historical critical method is also going to observe that the two words highlighted in brown on your screen, freedom and serve, come from opposite semantic fields. Freedom refers to not being a slave, whereas service is the ordinary verb used to describe what a slave does. It's gonna notice that opposition and it's gonna recognize that these terms have been used extensively in the moral teachings going back to the Hebrew Bible. And so it's going to do a comprehensive study of how does Paul take these two concepts and employ them here at the service of his point to the Galatian Christians. Also that word brothers, is, we're going to look historically and ask, does Paul mean only men? Or does he mean all Christians, male and female alike? The historical critical method is going to conclude that Paul, when he wrote a letter, intended it for public proclamation in the Galatian churches, and so it includes everybody. So that would give rise to a brothers and sisters interpretation of the single word adelphoi, which is masculine plural, most literally meaning brothers. Another complicated case in which historical critical scholars are going to use word study to answer a difficult question is the meaning of the word God here in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, and even though our gospel is veiled, it is veiled for those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The question is this, does that first occurrence of Theos, God of this age, refer to the real God, the God of Israel, God the Father, or does it instead refer to a so-called God, perhaps the evil one? or some other kind of, some kind of idolatry, something sinister. St. Augustine interpreted this to mean the real God. That runs us into the problem of determinism. St. Augustine likely had in mind the Manichees and other heretics of his age when saying the God of this age, he wanted to emphasize there's not a good God and a bad God. The question for historical critical scholars is, what was Paul's most likely meaning? And one tool that we have is to compare how did Paul use this same noun elsewhere in the Pauline corpus. And we see in Philippians that Paul did use the word theos to refer to something other than the real God. When he said, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame. He's referring to another heterodox group. So based on this evidence, scholars are going to conclude that in 2 Corinthians, Paul is not referring to the real God blinding the unbelievers but rather the God of this age, perhaps a circumlocution for Satan, or perhaps a symbol of their pride or their dedication to the pagan gods. This brings us to synchronic uses of word study. In synchronic analysis, especially in narrative analysis and rhetorical analysis, we're looking for when words go beyond the dictionary meaning. We're looking for when words and the manners of speaking add something literarily. We're looking for figurative language. We're looking for irony. Here are some questions on your screen that we might ask when applying synchronic methods to studying the Bible. Does this word choice depart from the inspired author's default usage? If so, with what added meaning? That's like that example of our son versus your son from the hypothetical wife to her husband. Other questions, why would the inspired author select these words out of any number of possibilities for expressing the same thing? Why does the inspired author include some apparent digression? Where is their irony? What does word choice allow us to infer about the characters? Symbols, how are they used and with what effect? Word plays and puns, what are they saying? And what literary devices are present? In other words, we want to take a comprehensive reading of the biblical text. Let's look at one last example from 1 Kings 21.21. Here Elijah is pronouncing judgment to King Ahab, and he says, I am bringing evil upon you. I will consume you and will cut off every male belonging to Ahab, whether bond or free in Israel. Except the text doesn't actually say male here. It says rather, I will cut off everyone who urinates on a wall belonging to Ahab. How graphic. How nasty is referring to the peeing habits of male sons of Ahab. Why? Because this is a crude idea. 
Elijah is angry with Ahab. He is pronouncing judgment and punishment on Ahab, and it's fitting that the punishment sound as ugly as the action for which Ahab is being punished, namely killing Naboth. It's just one example. This is all about reading the Bible closely, and that's what we want to do. In our next class, we'll look at more about the history behind the text, the evolution that the text went through before it came into its final form. Until then, read well and pray well.